Mr. Uriel Levy from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel, who is going to talk about advanced applications with metasurfaces and hyperbolic metamaterial cavities. So that's all from me, Uriel, and you can start. Hello. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. I uh, feel so sorry that um, I, or everything is online and not uh, in person because I, I, I believe that uh, an in-person meeting is always better. Uh, but this is the situation as of today, so uh, we have to comply with the rules. Um, as Stefan was saying, he will be teaching online after his talk. I will be teaching also after my talk, so I also apologize. But here now in Israel, we have started uh, to do face-to-face uh, -face teaching. So uh, I actually have to go physically to, to, uh, to the classroom. Uh, okay. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, I will be talking to you a little bit about some of the stuff we are doing with metasurfaces and metamaterials over the last couple of, mostly over the last couple of years. With, I'll touch on just an early work just as a, uh, introduction, but then I will be talking about more recent works. Um, I had uh, like a hard choice. What should I include and what should I not include here? Uh, because 50 minutes uh, uh, is, is of course limited and uh, we have more, more works, but I have chosen some of the uh, stuff, but uh, you can also visit our website, uh, which is listed here down here. And then you can see some more results related to uh, meta surfaces. And if you have some questions, I'll be happy to uh, answer offline by email or by by calls later. Uh, whatever works for you, that works for me as well. Uh, so let let's begin. Um, and um, the talk will be divided maybe into a portion of the electric meta surface and a portion of hyperbolic meta material cavities. Uh, we will start with the dielectric metasurfaces and maybe, um, of course, we had some, some very interesting introduction uh, before, but I will still use the uh, stage and discuss why should we, in general, use uh, dielectric for metasurfaces, why not only metal? So, there are several advantages. One would be that we have two sets of resonances, not only what we call the electric resonance, but also the magnetic resonance. That's opposed to metal where we don't have the magnetic resonance. Um, if we talk about loss, these dielectric could be of low loss. That depends, of course, on which dielectric we are using uh, and what's the wavelengths we are using. But in principle, let's say if we take silicon and uh, the wavelengths of choice is, is uh, such that the phot photon energy is just below the bang up, then of course, loss is negligible. Uh, tunability. So if we take metal, we have pretty much uh, fixed properties for the metal, but if we take the electric, we can say inject carriers, deplete carriers, um, we can use the thermo optic effect. So there are many, many mechanisms by which we can tune the properties of the dielectric metal surfaces, which I think is more flexible compa as compared to uh, metal. Um, robustness, say, um, fabrication could be CMOS compatible. It can sustain significant amount of light. Metal would typically, most metals, not all metals, but most metals will kind of melt at, at, at some temperature. Uh, but there are many challenges. So uh, we have to control the geometry very precisely. The field enhancement is typically not as good as in metals. Uh, what are the spectral properties that we are looking at? Uh, tunability is achieved, but we want cloud tunability, and this is, of course, a great challenge. So, uh, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of uh, yeah. we have some echo, I think. Yeah. So now it's okay. Uh, there are a lot of challenges to be uh, faced, and that's good because otherwise we would not have anything to do. Um, just a, um, maybe an earlier work, it was uh, like how we can use uh, uh, these meta surfaces for polarization selective uh, holography. So the idea is that uh, we shine one type of polarization and we generate 
one type of image, and then we switch to the orthogonal polarization, and by doing so, we ending up with a completely different image. So it's like two different images, two say completely non-correlated images uh, for the two uh, orthogonal polarization. And the basis that we have been using is the basis of uh, left and right circularly polarized light. So there's uh, some mathematics uh, behind here, but basically what should I say is that, that if we use a specific type of meta surface, which is the phase is what is called the geometrical phase. So these meta surfaces are having some kind of a birefringence and uh, this birefringence is opposite if you shine one or, or the other uh, polarization. So we get like a phase for one polarization and the conjugate phase for the other polarization. Now, if we take uh, if we take a phase as a conjugate phase and we go all the way to the Fourier domain, then there is no much difference between the image that will be reconstructed other than just rotation. But if we don't go all the way to the Fourier domain, we kind of go halfway or only to the Fresnel domain, then of course we have some degree of freedom because the Fresnel phase can be either adds up or uh, being subtracted from the uh, phase that we have depending on the polarization. And by doing so, we can have two different images. And this trivial example that I provided here is like a lens. Let's say for one polarization, it will be a converging lens. For the other polarization, it will be a diverging lens. So of course we can get two different patterns. And if we go into the focal plane of the lens, in one polarization, we'll get like a delta function, like a, a, a spot. And in the other polarization, we'll get like a um, spread beam because the, uh, uh, focal was uh, the, the focal point was kind of conjugate was like a virtual uh, spot. So that's like an example that we can get two different reconstructions from these two different uh, um, from these two different uh, polarization. But we want to do it more uh, in a more advanced way. We want to control the images well, not just like a point, but really two different images. So this is the hologram that we have been using. It's like a 128 by 128 pixels. Uh, with a pixel size at that time was like eight micron. And we have been using this geometrical phase concept in for which that by just rotating the, um, the uh, orientation of this grating, you can control the pace. And why is it so? It is because of the fact that if you think about it, the uh, eigenvectors of the rotation matrix are the uh, circular bases uh, polarization 1j and 1 minus j. So if you shine eigenvector into your system, you end up with the eigenvector up to a phase term, okay? Because these are unitary matrices. So based on that, we have been uh, fabricating the element. It looks like that you can see the SEM pictures and you can see the results where we have for one polarization, the letter pole and for the other polarization, the letter cell. So it's a polarization selective element left is is, is uh, experimental results right is um, um simulation results so you can see that that was kind of uh, five six years ago already just to show you the flexibility of this uh, platform of the electric meta surface okay now we move on and uh, we want to uh, go into some advanced application of meta surfaces typically people will be using ebeam and rie uh, to have these dielectric meta surfaces uh, and material of choice can be all kinds of materials, but maybe the uh, uh, most common one would be amorphous silicon. People are typically using amorphous silicon or silicon. So we were thinking of something slightly else, uh, a different way of making those uh, meta surfaces. And uh, let me show you what we're we doing. And also I will explain why are we doing it. So uh, the idea was taken from a previous work of ours by making locus waveguide. What is locus? Locus stands for local oxidation of silicon. Okay, so instead of etching the silicon, we are uh, oxidizing the silicon. So we are converting silicon to silicon dioxide. And by doing that, we are changing the properties, of course, of the material, and we change the refractive index of the material in a controlled way. Um, as you can see here, we have developed an approach which is sort of planar. So um, not only you have the waveguide, as you can see, this is silicon here. 
it is surrounded by oxide, but it's sort of planar up to some kind of a small uh, ripple here. You see that the structure is planar without the need for further planarization. So now it's a very nice platform because you can think of having a second floor and a third floor. So you can think of not only one layer of metal surface, but few layers of metal surface. So let's call it 2.5 dimensional metal surface. So metal material is 3D, metal surface is 2D. And here we can think of somewhere in between having few layers of, of uh, metal surfaces, and that would provide us with some more degrees of freedom. Um, okay, so the motivation for the waveguide work at the time was uh, to have low loss waveguide because when you are oxidizing the silicon, the sidewalls are very, very smooth, unlike etching where you end up with more rough surfaces. Uh, that was the motivation to begin with. Uh, but also, as I mentioned, we can end up with a quasi planar structure. And it's a very robust because these disks eventually will be surrounded by oxide. So mechanically, they are more stable. And, and we can do some post processing because let's say we are fabricating something and we would like to have some resonance shift. We can keep oxidizing. And by doing that, we can shift the resonance after the fact. So that's another advantage of this platform. Um, let me show you the original work, uh, how we did it. That was like a amorphous silicon layer with silicon nitride on top and electron beam resist. So first you do the, lithog the lithography, very standard, defining the disks. Then you do only partial edge. Uh, let's say if you want a height of edge, you would edge something like edge divided by two. This is like a typical uh, recipe. And the uh, now you do the locus, the oxidation of the silicon. And as you can see, these silicon disks are now being encapsulated by the oxide. Uh, so you can see results before oxidation and after oxidation on the right. Uh, so, so that kind of works. Uh, and you can do all kinds of shapes like a, a circular, a circular disks, cylindrical disks, or rectangular structures. And the lattice can be rectangular lattice or hexagonal lattice, depending on what you want. Uh, you can take a look at the cross section. So take a look at the cross section here. You see the amorphous silicon here, and it is surrounded by uh, these uh, uh, silicon dioxide. And uh, you can take a look also at some AFA measurements. So you see planarization other than this kind of a, a, a change between, but if we would keep oxidizing, then we would even close this gap. And even this gap, as you can see, is relatively small in, in height compared to the 200 nanometer height of the of the original disk. So it's a, at least quasi planar uh, approach to begin with. Um, and then you ask yourself about the resonance, uh, the resonances that we have here. This is like a transmission experiment in sim this is simulation actually. So you can see how the resonances are being changed with the antenna radius, with the disk radius over here, and also as a function of wavelength. So it's a 2D map showing the uh, transmission. Blue means that there is a resonance. It's a dip in the transmission. And you can see the two modes, the magnetic mode and the uh, uh, electric mode. And you see that by, by controlling the antenna radius, these two modes can kind of overlap spectrally, which means this is the, what is known as the Kerker condition, uh, then the uh, transmission can go high, and then you can get this two pi phase jump as, as being done in other uh, structures. Um, this is simulation, and now I'm taking a snapshot just for a specific radius of 330 nanometer, which is the one that we have been fabricating later. So you can see this resonance, you can see the magnetic resonance, and the magnetic dipole, and the electric dipole in here. These are higher order uh, terms. These are already because of diffraction. So for shorter wavelengths, the structure is not sub wavelengths anymore, and then you get some diffraction. This is the experimental results, which is very similar to the uh, simulation results. So you see the two modes, and you see how they kind of overlap spectrally here. Uh, so uh, the way we did it, we have made many, many samples with different uh, uh, antenna radius. So each uh, a jump like that is a different uh, radius. I think we had like 20 different samples from which we have been extracting this uh, measurement uh, map. 
Um, and now let me put one by one, uh, side by side, the simulation and the experimental results. So you see the simulation on the left, the measurement on the right, and the antenna radius is varying from small to high as we go up. Uh, and you see that the simulation and the measurements, at least qualitatively, they are in very good agreement. Uh, quantitatively, of course, there are some differences because the shape of the fabricated structure is not identical to the simulated one. Um, okay, so that's showing that we can do it, but what can we really trim it? Can we change the resonance after the fact? And we can do that. So you can see the uh, structure, let's say, on the top, on the left before oxidation, then we are oxidizing it. So the central part is silicon and it is now surrounded by oxide. Oxide, of course, has much lower uh, refractive index. So in fact, uh, oxidation means that we are blue shifting the, the resonance. Uh, and uh, you can see that very nicely. So before oxidation, that's the red curve. And you can see some resonance in here. And now after oxidation, it's now the green. So you see the blue shift from around say 1400 to around like 1300 in resonance. So it's about like 100 nanometer of a shift. It's a large shift just by oxidation. Okay. And then uh, if we further remove also the silicon nitrate because we had silicon nitrate cap, then there is further uh, blue shift a little bit. But the main, main result is the shift from the red one to the uh, green one. So you can see that this approach can be used for uh, trimming of the structure. So let's say you are you want to hit the resonance wavelengths. So the best way to go is to fabricate the structure deliberately, a little bit red shifted, and then you measure and you see how much of a of a blue shift you need to do. Then it tells you how much time you should oxidize it in the oven in the furnace, uh, and then you end up with the resonance frequency the way you want it. Because if you just hit, the, if you just try to hit uh, the resonance in fabrication, it, it's very difficult. You have to have like a full array and then kind of choose the right one. But if you want really to a specific device to hit your resonance, then this is a nice approach because it allows you to uh, trim the device after fabrication. Um, there is another way of, 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 uh, of trimming. This work has been done uh, while I was uh, in, in Denmark, uh, working with the, the group of Anis Christensen from DTU and the Asger Mortensen at that time also at DTU. Uh, later, he moved to SDU. Uh, so this is an approach that they have been uh, developed. And the idea is that uh, you are trimming the structure, you are changing the structure by sort of resonance. And let me show you how it works. So uh, the idea is as follows. Let's say uh, you start with sort of a template. So it's a material in which you have just metal surfaces like array of disks which are designed to show resonance, let's say, for a wavelength of 532 nanometer, uh, double the NDR, for example. So here is your excitation beam, and clearly the excitation beam, even if you focus it down with a high NA system, it is still larger than, than uh, say, like full width half maximum, maybe it's like 300 nanometer or so. Now uh, you have modulation. Why do you have modulation? Because these beams overlap with several uh, disks of the array, let's say three by three. And the end result would be what you see, uh, what you see on the right. Uh, so basically you have to convolve, uh, the left one with the middle one and you are getting the right one. So only one peak, the central peak would have sufficient energy to kind of ablate the structure. So it's a nonlinear thermal effect. Uh, up to some point, nothing happened to the structure. And as you go beyond some threshold intensity, you start melting the structure and changing the uh, uh, changing the properties. And by doing so, you can really end up with very high spatial resolution. Specifically, in that case, it's like uh, over 100,000 DPI dots per inch laser printing approach. So that's what they have been uh, developed. And later on, we have been making these structures. You can see this Mona Lisa based on this uh, approach, and that's a very nice uh, tool. So uh, you can see also some other uh, nice uh, pictures. Um, but but one uh, caveat of that is the time that it takes to write the structure. It's 
I mean, you have to scan the whole structure by laser and that takes some time. So the idea is instead of scanning a point by point, why not generating something called holographic resonant laser printing by which you are illuminating uh, the whole structure. You are illuminating the whole structure at one shot and you are basically projecting, projecting an image onto this uniform layer of meta surface and after projecting the image with proper parameters, then you are imprinting the image on the uh, meta surface. So for that, we have constructed this holographic, holographic setup. There was a, a quite complicated setup with a beam expander and then an SLM and the image of the SLM has been imaged basically to the back plane uh, of the microscope, uh, back, uh, focal plan, back focal plane of the microscope objective in here. And also you have to expand the beam because you have to make sure that you are using the full aperture of your microscope objective, otherwise you are losing resolution. And then what you get is like the Fourier transform of the image. So you are uh, designing the SLM to generate the Fourier transform of what you want to see uh, on top of the meta surface. And eventually you are doing something like that. So you can see it's a nice movie how to imprint Fresnel lenses uh, just very quickly on the structure. So you can see uh, it's in here. And that has been slowed down on purpose just for the purpose of visualization so you can see the movie. Um, okay, let's now talk about a very hot topic, the meta lens. So what is a meta lens? It's basically, it's a lens, but it's a very thin lens. And uh, basically the idea is to reduce the cost and the size of optical system by using, hopefully, some kind of a single element. And it should be ideally like stimulus compatible in the design and fabrication. Um, now, parameters are important. So in particular, we are talking about like wide field of view imaging system, which is something that you would see on your cell phone, for example. Uh, so uh, maybe also home security camera. These are, say, two potential applications for these uh, meta surfaces. Now, before we came into the field, we have seen many works on the, uh, these meta lenses, but we could not identify a meta lens with the specific uh, design parameters that are relevant to the application that I've just mentioned. So there were lots of demonstrations, but not with these parameters that uh, we have been uh, uh, seeking. And also, uh, most of these demonstrations we have seen there have been captured in the lab. So in the lab, it's kind of very nice because you have your laser light and you can change the intensity of your laser up to the point that there will be sufficient signal to noise ratio so you can show an image. But if you want to go outdoor and based on uh, the sunlight that you have, uh, then your SNR is limited. This is something you have to think of. Okay, so we have been uh, taking these considerations in mind and uh, uh, produce a lens. I'll show you the results in a second. But just before that, I'd like to uh, pinpoint to a paper of ours from last year, which is discussing the uh, about the advantages of meta lenses as compared to the diffractive lenses, the kind of known diffractive optics lenses that have been used for the last uh, couple of decades. And this is a very active uh, field and uh, sometimes very emotional. People have a lot to say about what is better, a meta lens or a diffractive lens. I don't think there is a clear answer here. Uh, so please take a look at this pa at our paper uh, with more in-depth discussion and comparison between the two types of uh, lenses. Okay, let's go back to our lens for outdoor imaging with wild, uh, wide uh, field of view. Uh, so there are some issues to tackle, and uh, in particular is the chromatic aberration. So chromatic aberration can take two forms. One is the axial chromatic aberration. Let's say we are illuminating on axis, and the problem is that the focal length is depending on the wavelength because of the diffraction effect. So you see that the focal length is varying uh, over uh, the wavelengths with this delta f, uh, depending on the delta lambda. Delta lambda is the span of wavelengths we are taking, we are looking at. Okay, so that's one um, that's one type of operation. But for the same reason, what happens if you come off axis? You are illuminating your lens off axis, so not only you will have the focal uh, plane 
different, but also the location, the specific spatial location of the focus is different between the two colors, as you can see over here in this example. So um, you can see that uh, we have one, uh, one color is focused here, the other color is being focused here, and the third color is being focused here. So there are two shifts. One shift is longitudinal, and the other one is lateral. Okay, we have to take care of both. Um, and uh, prior to our work, we have seen some some uh, uh, works about uh, a wide field of view, uh, metal and some attempts. There was one result with diffractive optics that dated back to the uh, 1989 by, by uh, Michael Morris. It's a very nice one. And then a more recent one with the Nature Form published by the group of uh, uh, <clears throat> By, by Arbabi et al. That's the group from uh, from uh, Caltech. Okay, so um, the, the the idea was to have a doublet, like two metal lenses that would make some compensation. Uh, so here is our design. What we are doing is we are using something called an aperture stop, which is about one millimeter away of the uh, metal surface. That really helps in the optical design, and then you can apply uh, like standard. Optical codes like Code Five or Zmax to design your your rim uh, rays and to look into the performance. The way you really evaluate the performance of your lens is this MTF, the modulation transfer function. That's the right way to uh, evaluate your lens. So you can see the uh, black curve is is the ideal case, where which is the diffraction limit. And you see that in our case, we are not far away from being diffraction limited. So. Uh, you can see what happened as we are 20 degrees uh, out of uh, uh, on axis, so like off axis by 20 degrees, and even by 40 degrees is not too bad. Definitely not too bad. Um, so we have been uh, looking into this design, some some kind of uh, tricks that uh, we play, and um, basically as we have been aiming to cell phone application, we have designed the F number to be 2.5. Uh, that's the diameter of something like one one point something millimeters, and you can see now this metal lens is in fabrication. This is uh, based on resonance structures, uh, and they show modulation of the phase from zero to two pi, uh, and and so you can see that's the modulation phase here on the right, this is from zero to two pi depending on the antenna radius, and the transmission for most in most cases transmission is high, uh, definitely for the smaller ones. Then we are suffering some degradation in transmission, but at least it's 70, maybe 80% uh, all over the place, which is not too bad. Um, okay, so we have made uh, this lens, and you can see this is just a zoom in on the specific region out of the whole aperture of the lens. Um, and then we start characterizing the lens. So this is the uh, measurements that we have. So on top of the simulation, this MPF simulation I showed you before. But now below that, you can see the measurements. So we have characterized our system uh, by measuring the MTF, which we believe is the right way to characterize those lenses. And you can see that the uh, results are very similar between the simulation and the experiment. And we still get some very nice uh, results. Uh, this is the setup to characterize uh, the lens. And for more details, you can take, at this, uh, take a look at this nanophotonics uh, paper uh, in here. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, the efficiency uh, as a function of being off axis is, is kind of okay, but the overall efficiency was not that great. We had some discrepancy between simulation and uh, experiment. We are still looking for the results. We are not sure why, why is that. And at the end of the day, uh, we have been using this lens. So what we have done is something very simple. Uh, we have been taking just a standard CMOS camera from Tolabs without the lens. We have added our metal lens instead uh, with C-mount and everything. Then we also added a spectral filter on top, and we have been taking pictures of the group. You can see this is the group member picture. Outdoor, no active illumi illumination, just passive illumination next to our building. And you can see this is me, and this is Jacob Engelberg, who did most of the work around here. Um, so that result also was uh, with the help of the uh, group of uh, Anis Christensen from DPU. They were helping in the fabrication. 
Uh, <clears throat> then the question is, okay, uh, how can we optimize the spectral bandwidth? So what are the trade-offs? Uh, it goes like that. If you are using only one wavelength, then there is no problem of uh, chromatic aberration, but the problem is you will not have sufficient light. We are talking about outdoor imaging applications where you have some kind of a given amount of light coming from the sun and you want to use as many photons as possible. But these many photons as possible will degrade the quality of your image because of chromatic aberration. So it's like two contradicting effects. On one hand, you want to use as small bandwidth as possible to avoid aberration. On the other hand, you want to use as, as, as large as possible uh, bandwidth to collect more photons. So there is clearly a trade-off. And for when you see this kind of a trade-off, you would always look for some kind of an optimum. So it's an optimization problem. And we have done that. And the criteria for this optimization is what we call the average SNR. What does it mean average? Average over the whole spatial frequencies. So for each spatial frequencies, uh, for each spectral frequency, you have different signal to noise because as you go higher in spatial frequencies, you have attenuation from your optical system. This is what the MPF uh, is telling us about. So uh, we have been looking into average SNR, also more or less like the area um, uh, within the uh, MPF regime. And by doing so, we have uh, taken into account standard uh, sunlight that we know what's the distribution, spectral distribution of the sunlight, and we've been optimizing the problem. Uh, and as you can see here, this is the F number on one hand, this is the spectral range on the other hand. So for each F number, there is a different value, which is the optimized value. So you see the solution, this is the solution uh, for optimization, uh, the function of the uh, F number of the lens. And uh, based on that, we have been optimizing it. In for real scenario, it should be somewhere between 20, 10 and say 50 nanometer. These are the ideal numbers depending on the specific uh, F number. So we have been optimizing that and you can see some more results in this uh, paper over here. We have been uh, experimentally validating our hypothesis and we have seen, you can see here, for example, the original image uh, just uh, is being based on resolution because uh, the bandwidth is too large, so aberration kills you. Then we have been optimizing it around 50 nanometer in this case. So you can see very nicely the image. And as we are shrinking the bandwidth to only 10 nanometer, then uh, of course the fidelity is good, but you see that you are noise limited. You see this kind of uh, salt and pepper noise because your SNR kills you. So there's definitely optima optimum between the right and left image. And here is the optimum around here. Um, Okay, let's see how much time do I have. Uh, I wanted to talk about nonlinear non -linear dielectric metasurface, but I don't think I have the time for that. Let me just brief you, tell me, brief, brief me, briefly tell you that we have been using amorphous silicon and we were able to see second harmonic generation. This is not to be underestimated because you know that silicon is central symmetric material, so you are not expecting second harmonic generation out of silicon. <laughs> However, because metasurfaces have lots of surfaces, so these surfaces kind of break the symmetry and the, this uh, uh, second harmonic, the chi 2 effect, occurs only on the surface of the structure. And then by selecting a specific geometry of this kind of L shape, um, so you, you kind of have a, it's called L1 rotation symmetry. And by doing that, you can see some kind of uh, uh, effect. And also you can control the phase of the nonlinear hologram simply by rotate, rotating these elements. So we have done that. Uh, I'll skip some of the details because we don't have the time. If you want to go into more details, please take a look at this uh, nanoletter uh, paper. Um, you can see here the amorphous silicon uh, dimensions of a single antenna. We ended up of, of making array of those. Um, so first we have been simulating the individual response and the collective response of the nano antenna in the linear domain around 800, which is the fundamental harmonic and the 400 nanometer, which is the second harmonic. Um, and then we have been making the structure 
uh, with the following experimental setup. It's a very challenging setup for the following reason. The efficiency of the second harmonic is very low compared to the fundamental. So you really have to filter out very, very good, I would say, in order to see the second harmonic and avoid the, to see the fundamental, but it's possible to do that. Uh, so with the tie up, eventually we can see the second harmonic generation counts as a function of, so this is the output in as, as a function of the input intensity. So you see the curvature with a, a log profile of two. Um, and then we have been uh, generating these holograms simply as I mentioned by rotating. So the rotation corresponds to phase. And uh, you can see how we kind of flip it by 180 degrees. And for, for linear phase, if you know geometrical uh, uh, phase in linear, in the linear domain, that would generate two pi phase jump and two pi phase jump is like zero phase jump. So for the linear domain, this grating does nothing. Okay, because zero and two pi phase is the same. But for the nonlinear case, it can do either pi phase jump or three over, or, or, or three times pi over phase jump. And both are significant. So you, you are expecting diffraction in the nonlinear regime, and you are not expecting diffraction in the linear regime. And in essence, that's what we have seen. You see that in the linear regime, it's like two pi phase jump. So you just see the uh, delta function in the center. But as you are moving to your uh, second harmonic, you, you see it's kind of faint, but still you see the central point, but also the two side lobes over here uh, corresponding to uh, pi, and also we have the three pi uh, phase. So we are definitely being able to see that, and you see that in cross section, these two uh, harmonics that are corresponding to the diffraction from the second harmonic uh, uh, signal. So I will skip this uh, further and move to uh, the last uh, topic. Uh, I'm going to spend like five, six minutes on that, and then leave you with the five minutes for questions. So the idea is basically to use hyperbolic meta materials. So uh, these materials, they have, uh, say, uh, epsi positive epsilon in one direction, negative epsilon in the other direction. And by doing so, you end up with an elliptical isofrequency uh, surface, uh, something like you see over here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of known. And people are doing that typically by many ways, uh, typically you can see that uh, these are made of uh, these hyperbolic materials are made of uh, alternating layers. And then the idea is that you have this regime where you have propagating wave. This is the, the standard diffraction. And as you are looking into this domain, these are the, this is the domain of higher k vector, vector modes. Uh, so the k vector is much higher, and basically you can end up with significant uh confinement of light very high k vectors and very high per cell factor so this is all known and there are many ways of implementing these uh, hyperbolic meta materials I've, I've listed some here in in, in this uh, figure um but we are, what we are doing is we are making hmm cavity array so hyperbolic meta material cavity array so the uh sub wavelengths is happening in both dimensions both in the say vertical direction where we have the stack of layers between stack between the electric and metal, that's the stack. But also we are making patterns along the X, Y directions, generating these pillars over here. Um, so we are really getting the best of all worlds in a sense. Um, and uh, of course, then we can use it, for example, to enhance per cell factor, which is the Q over V. Um, and let me show you two experiments that we have been making. In one case, we have been so we are making those elements now a routine in the lab, and we are now trying to couple it with some materials. So two materials we have been used to couple uh, uh, HMM with is one is the quantum dots, and the other one is WS2. It's a 2D uh, material. So let's start with the quantum dot. Uh, we are defining this three parameter. It's a far field emission enhancement. Basically, we are having this quantum dot not as a dipole emitting light. And if this dipole is placed in the vicinity of the HMM, then it will emit much more light. So the three is by how much we have been enhancing it. So you see that uh, this curve in here, the transmission goes down and the enhancement uh, goes up. 
you see the enhancement can go up by say uh, 20, 15, 20 easily. And this has been published in nano letters. Uh, you can see the reference to the paper. Uh, you can see basically how much we have been enhancing the PL, the photoluminescence, depending on the specific radius of the HMM cavity. So um, the control pattern is really like almost flat. And now we are trying to optimize our HMM cavity. And as we are hitting this uh, uh, dispersion, the elliptical dispersion, we end up with significantly more counts compared to the reference sample. And the enhancement has been in the similar in the measurements we have seen enhancement of about six over here. Uh, so also we have been measuring lifetime, and in the lifetime we have also seen uh, improvement. So the improvement is both in the time domain and also in the spectral domain. We are seeing it both. So either by measuring the photoluminescence intensity or by measuring the uh, time domain. Um, the other experiment is with WS2 coupled to the HMM cavity. So again, we have made the cavities and you can see the transmission of the cavities without the WS2. And now the idea is to design the HMM cavity such that the scattered um, cross-section is spectrally separated from the absorption uh, uh, cross-section. And this can be achieved in this uh, uh, special dispersion pattern that we have. And if you can really separate the scattering from the absorption, you gain a lot because this absorption is basically sort of a quench if you want to uh, be stay in this regime and not to have absorption or vice versa. Perhaps you want to enhance absorption of the material and diminish the scattering. So this helps us to separate spectrally between the two. And uh, you can see here a few different points. As we keep going in wavelengths, we are more, uh, say, in the hyperbolic domain. And indeed, as we are there, we are separating better between the scattering and the absorption cross-section, as opposed to, say, the red point, where the uh, we are barely in negative epsilon, and then we don't have this separation. Um, finally, take a look at the, just the emission of light from this WS2 where it's just on top of glass or on top of our HMM cavity. So I think it's a very striking uh, difference between the two. And you can see how much we have been enhancing. So we are basically enhancing it by a factor of 30. But if you normalize to a single antenna, because the density is limited. So if you are calculating what is the enhancement of a single antenna, that's actually about 3,000 fold enhancement for a single antenna, just by the fact that we are uh, coupling light to these hyperbolic modes. So also the time domain shows the enhancement. Um, and uh, I think that would be a good time to, to finish. I've shown you some nice ways to fabricate the electric metal surfaces. And we have discussed some uh, optimization of metal lenses and also the enhancement of PL from my quantum dots and from WS2. Um, it's a good time to finish. Uh, if you have questions, please let me know either now or after the fact by sending emails. I'll be very happy to discuss further. Thank you very much. So, so thank you very much, uh, Uriel. So the time for questions. I don't, if, I, I don't see any hands, but so you I'm can sorry. ask, please go on. Yeah, so hello, Uriel. Uh, first, a comment that uh, Israel is quite sunny, so your proof of concept is <laughs> a little bit shady. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, the question is, uh, there, there is uh, Federico Capasso has a startup with MetaLens. Uh, your country is very famous for startups, so are there any startups related to MetaLens around? Um... So but it's not something that is public, but I know of some efforts to, to, to do some, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's still not. Yeah, I don't think there is something that has been kind of public. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe I missed the point concerning that local, local oxidation. It was done by, how was it done? It was done by, by a laser or? 
I don't okay, know. so you well, uh, you can do it by two ways. The, the results that I have shown, uh, the, the oxidation was in the furnace, and I have a result which was not published yet and I have not shown today, in which we are doing it the same by laser. And by laser, the advantage of doing it by laser is that you can decide which specific antenna you are oxidizing. So it does not have to be homogeneous. On the other okay. hand, of course, it takes uh, some time because we have to scan. So there are pros and cons for each of these approaches. Okay. The results that I have today, the oxidation was in the furnace. Yeah. Uh, what, what What is the time scale for that? Because those structures, no, those uh, dielectric structures are definitely higher than those metallic ones so so can you can you give some comment to that okay so um for, for the um with the laser just to ablate it you can do it uh, a single pulse for, for ablation a single pulse is sufficient to ablate the structure okay a single pulse okay. okay if you want to oxidize of course this takes more time because then you have to reduce the energy and you are based on thermal effect, which is sort of like equilibrium or, or steady state. You are changing the dimension of the time. It takes more time, but also not so much time. I think within a few seconds, you can oxidize the pillar or something like that. But if you want to just kind of ablate it, this is a single pulse is, is sufficient. And can you parallelize it somehow not to make yeah, it? Yeah, so basically you can think of doing the same as I showed you with these holograms. So you can okay. take a holographic image. Uh, and just instead of ablating it, you are uh, oxidizing it. And the, the 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 mechanism for oxidation is that you are having, say, a wet of wet surrounding, like a wet cell, and you are illuminating it with light. And the heating is coming from the light. You are tuning it to be just be just below the melting point, so it will not be melted, but it will be oxidized. Okay. Thank you. Any other question, please? So, 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 if not, would like to ask for that HMM cavity concerning coupling with those quantum dots uh, and uh, tungsten diselenite or what was it or sulfide? Uh, is it a strong coupling or can can you can you show it once again um, those, or how is it like or? Yeah, you can couple fairly strong. I mean. Uh... It's of course depending on the uh, position. Okay, so first, what we do, I did not go over the details, but what we do eventually, you can see this uh, like a typically structure is like a uh, silver and alumina, for example. Okay, and typically, what we are doing is we have uh, a, a, a capping layer to protect the structure of few nanometers. So, eventually, after, after this, this uh, pairs, like three pairs or something. Then we have a capping layer of say three, four nanometers to protect the structure. And on top of that, you have the quantum dots. So from position point of view, these quantum dots can be as close as possible, like three or four nanometers close to the uh, structure, but not really touching. You have to protect it somehow. This is important, I think, to avoid quenching and also to protect it uh, from oxidation and things like that. 